This episode of the Dirtbag Diaries is brought to you by Patagonia, makers of high-quality clothing and gear for outdoor sports, world travel, and daily lives that in harmony with nature. Visit them on the web at patagonia.com. From a distance, John Bombard appeared to be a very serious 17-year-old. He walked the halls of our high school wearing a scowl and carrying 40 pounds of textbooks. He was a gifted student and athlete, but he was never a teacher's pet or the coach's chosen one. If he didn't know you, he wasn't going to say anything to you. But if you were lucky enough to have been one of Bombard's friends, you were certain of a couple of things. First, underneath that stern demeanor, he was one of the goofiest, funniest, unique people you could ever meet. Second, when it came to his family and friends, His loyalty was unflinching. It was like gravity, absolute like a law of nature. We went to smart kid boarding school. It was the kind of place where they made us dress like we were headed for Wall Street. We went to school on Saturdays. The rule book was at least 200 pages thick. And stress relief came in a single form, laughter. I'm still not totally sure how Bombard and I became friends. Certainly we were pretty different. He had a reputation for mauling people in the hockey rink and wanted to follow his father's path into the armed services. I collected rare bootleg concert tapes and preferred cross-country skiing to Saturday afternoon hockey warship. But somehow, Bombard and I became friends. We were part of a small group of about 10 guys. Some of us could have hung out with the jocks, others could have been nerds or stoners. But we seemed bound together by laughter, rather than touchdowns or bags of weed. I don't really remember ever sleeping, but I remember my friends. And I remember laughing a lot. When we graduated high school, I went west. Bombard played two years of semi-pro hockey before enrolling at Holy Cross in Worcester, Mass. We saw each other a few times during those years, talked on the phone at holidays, but like a lot of high school friends, we were headed in different directions. In his senior year at Holy Cross, Bombard began having back pain. His hockey team trainers blamed it on a slip disc. It got worse, and by Christmas, Bombard could feel that he was losing control of his legs. After a few weeks of tests, biopsies, and anxiety, Bombard learned that he was facing what would likely be a losing battle. A particularly virulent tumor had wrapped itself around his spinal cord and was creeping upward. He could expect to lose control of his body one function at a time. Because of the proximity to the spine, treatment was close to impossible. So John would basically have to will the cancer out of his body. To his friends, a bunch of guys in their early 20s, it didn't seem all that impossible. More than once I remember someone saying, if anyone's stubborn enough to beat it, it's Bombard. That summer, around the 4th of July, I disappeared by myself into Washington State's enchantments, a rugged section of wilderness, jagged granite peaks, and rolling plateaus. I was 24 years old, the strongest physically and mentally I have ever been. Halfway through the day, I was climbing Prussic Peak's West Ridge, a classic Fred Becky route up a classic Northwest Peak. I stopped in my tracks. In front of me, to the right of the ridge, splitting this bone-white face of granite, were three tiny cracks, no bigger than the width of a finger. They cleave the mountain, the way lightning divides the night horizon. Here was this incredible, improbable looking route of the most prominent face of Washington's most photographic peak. It was both beautiful, terrifying, and inspiring. It looked perfect, and it hadn't been done. It was clear that I had been given a gift. I sat with my feet dangling off the West Ridge, tracing the possibilities through my mind. When I returned to the car, I was still smiling. It had been a perfect day. But as soon as I saw the voicemails pop up, I had sensed what had happened. Bombard died watching the Yankees game from the hospital bed in his childhood home. His father was right beside him. There was no dramatic moment. 
Bombard was there one second, and gone the next. I drove straight back from Leavenworth, and two days later I was on a red-eyed plane to New York City. By morning, I was listening to the clatter of the Long Island Railroad. I remember a lot about that day they'd buried Bombard. Walking in late to the ceremony, the banter of friends who haven't seen each other in years, accidentally leaving a fingerprint on John's coffin. Afterwards, we regrouped at the Bombard's family home. We played horseshoes, drank, told stories, drank more, and then told more stories. And I remember this certain moment, where one of Bombard's closest friends, a guy named Kleiman, was being hounded by everyone to tell a particularly funny Bombard story. And he's there, blushing and laughing. A dozen of us are heckling him, and he's hemming and hawing, and he says, I'll never forget it. Kleiman says, if I tell that story, Bombard is going to kill me. And everyone paused for a second. It had to be the only time anyone in that group ever noticed a grammatical misstep. And then I remember thinking, here I am, surrounded by some of my closest friends, people who helped build me, who helped shape my idea of right and wrong, and many of these people I hadn't seen in years, and in the morning, we were all headed our separate ways. These were people who helped shape me, yet on a day-to-day -day basis, I barely thought about them anymore. I had already started to forget them, and they were alive. Sometime in the middle of the night, I slunk away from the laughter and tears and crash landed on Bombard's lawn in a tired heap. I lay there for a moment too tired to crawl inside, stared up at the stars, and refused to believe that I would forget my friend. I knew what I had to do. It was all I had to offer. It was my own awkward prayer.